Ready to get started today? All right. There's some, um, there's some donuts up here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where we live. So they, they wanted me to do this um, presentation on know your loan types. I'm actually I'm, I haven't met a lot of you guys yet. I'm I'm going to be sitting in the office here um, for I work for Moving Mortgage, and I'm, my name is Sean Poole. I'll be I'll be here in the office with you um, every day now. So you'll see me set up. They're going to move me to the front office um, there in the lobby. 
you'll see me in there if you have any questions always come by um, so obviously any any loan questions always come by and ask me uh, but this is sort of a, a basic overview of different loan types i didn't i didn't go too in depth with them but we can you know sort of go tangent off of each thing and if you have any questions along the way just let me know i'll touch on some of the the high level things with different loans but we can we can dive further into them if you want to as well if you have any specific questions with them so to get started here's just a basic overview of different type of loans that there are uh, so we have conventional loans which conventional has Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac with two different two different guidelines depending on the the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac um, FHA VA USDA we have jumbo loans we have a really good jumbo product that I'm going to touch on um, down payment assistance programs so, so if, you're, if they're doing conventional FHA even VA and USDA can use down payment assistance too um, renovation loans we have as well and, and then we have broker options so if you have clients that are investors and, and they're buying multiple investment properties and they, they need to qualify a different route or if they have more than two finance properties or they have you know bank statement programs things like that for people that don't quite qualify for conventional loans so we'll touch on some of those some of those options so here's a basic breakdown of um now everyone is here you have this sheet up here um so different loan types and you know, have to move out back to the Hard to see them here. This is the this breakdown that you're looking at there. The different credit school requirements, their initial programs, as well as waiting periods for you know bankruptcy, foreclosure, things like that. Um, this is a, a good overview of the, the regular conventional FHA, VA, and USDA products uh, that we can do. So conventional. When you look at a conventional loan, it's anything up to $548, um, This year, every year changes a little bit. In the last, last six, seven years, they've changed every year. Um, it used to be like $417,000. This continues to go up. Next year, it'll probably go up even higher than this. So when you go above that, you get into the jumbo spectrum, which we'll touch on later. And then FHA has county limits. Um, so they're they're lower than $548,000. It's three hundred and I forget the weight kind of limits, 330 some thousand. Um, VA does not have loan limits. You can actually, the VA made a change in the last year to where a veteran that has full entitlement, they can buy a million dollar house with no down payment. It used to be they had to bring anything over that 548,000, they had to bring you know 25% of that difference, but now they can, they have full entitlement. They don't, they don't have to use on their entitlement on, a, on another house and they can, you know, go, any, you know, no limit there with no down payment. Conventional loans, this is a basic breakdown of conventional loans. Um, obviously, when you're at 20, putting less than 20% down on conventional loan, you can do as little as 3% now for first time home buyers. Uh, if, you, if you're not a first time home buyer, it's a minimum of 5% now. But when you're above that 20%, um, above the 80% loan of value, so you're putting less than 20% down, there is. Mortgage insurance required, which we can I can touch on a few different types of mortgage insurance and, and show you the difference between those. So eligible property types, you know, we can even do manufacturers on yes. Can you go over there again? You said three percent for first time buyers, right? For conventional. Yes, if you haven't owned a home in the last three years, that's considered first time home buyer. So you do three percent down payment. So in the last three years? Yes. Okay. yes. And then five percent minimum. Yeah, it's if you're not a first-time home buyer, it's five percent minimum down payment. And a lot of people they go into it thinking they they want to put twenty percent down. If we I can show them options of ten percent down, and you know they can you know save some of their down payment and, and avoid mortgage insurance on a monthly basis. So there's different things to look at with mortgage insurance that most loan officers don't really touch on. Uh, but I, can, I have different options and to show you. And I, I think I put in the PowerPoint here a couple of the mortgage insurance options. Uh, so eligible property types, obviously you can do you know, one to four unit primary and investment property. Um, second homes has to be a one unit. And then, you know, condos, you know, your, your townhouses, things like that. Manufactured homes you can do with a minimum of 5% down. Uh, you can't do the 3% down with manufactured homes, you can do 5% down there. And of course, module homes, which are technically treated like single family homes right now. 
So here's the different types of mortgage insurance. Uh, the most common one that most of you see is the monthly mortgage insurance, um, but it's it's usually not the best type of mortgage insurance for you know, depending on the, the buyer and, and their credit scores. If someone has a really good credit score, you know, most of my most of my people with really good credit scores that are putting you know, five to ten percent down or fifteen percent down, they end up doing the upfront mortgage insurance. So the the mortgage insurance companies and obviously they they protect the the lender against default. So, so you're not 20, putting 20 percent down equity there. Um, if we were to foreclose on the property, they would make sure that they have some protection there with the, the value. Um, so that the mortgage insurance protects us against default. But you know, 95 percent of lenders out there are only quote monthly mortgage insurance. But I have a lot of clients that if they have a you know, 760, 780 credit score, they can do a 10 percent down loan and you know pay three or four thousand dollars up front to avoid that monthly mortgage insurance that could cost them you know, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars over, you know, seven, eight years of the paying. So there's different different ways to, to structure that that are, that are really good for, for buyers. And it obviously decreases that payment as well if you're not paying that monthly mortgage insurance. So and it, it, they, they could be paying you know, 80 to 100 dollars a month in monthly mortgage insurance and avoid that by paying it up front. Or, and even if you're putting, you know, 10 percent down on the loan, you can finance that single premium mental loan and, you know, not bring that money to the table, but you're also not putting in your mortgage payment that much. Because you're only financing, you know, three, three, four thousand dollars a year on top of your regular mortgage. So, some really good ways to structure that. Um, lender paid mortgage insurance used to be a big thing. It's the way the the rate sheets are now, it's not as not as big. Um, that basically is you get a higher rate, and the lender gives you a credit to offset the mortgage insurance, and it really takes care of the upfront mortgage insurance by giving the lender credit to offset it. Um, that's not a that's not a, a big factor these days. A few years ago, they used to be a big thing for people that are putting you 3% down or 5% down. So that's one-time thing? What is it one-time thing? So that that basically, let's say you were getting a 3% interest rate today, right. you can get a 3.375 rate and avoid month, avoid the mortgage insurance by doing lender pay because it bumps up the rates and it gives a, the lender a credit to then offset your mortgage insurance. Um, most people, you know, it's it takes more than that now. It used to be, it wouldn't take much to get that lender credit to where we can offset it, but now it takes you know so much it could be a half percent or you know six eight you know six eight difference there that it's really you know not as not as beneficial to you there to to go that route. So most most people end up doing you know if you're putting minimum down payment, most people end up doing the monthly mortgage insurance now, um, or if you're putting down you know five to ten percent down, we if you have good credit score, then the upfront mortgage insurance option is usually better than lender lender paid mortgage insurance. So if you get loans only for how long? It depends. Yeah, so it depends. Technically, this technically goes on the standard amortization. So whenever you close the amortization schedule that the attorney gives you there um, that with the lender package, it goes off of that. And it's usually, you know, if you're if you're putting down you know three percent down or five percent down, two percent down, it's gonna vary based on how long it takes you to get to that 78 threshold there. Um, so it could be anywhere from you know, seven years to 10 or 11 years of paying that, which is why that upfront mortgage insurance premium can a lot of times save you a lot of money in the long run instead of paying that for, you know, 10 years or eight years, whatever the, whatever that number is, then you can pay it up front and avoid a lot of, a lot of premiums. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, conventional condos, I mainly put this in here because there's a, a common misconception out there as far as like what is non-warrantable versus what is warrantable. Uh, when you're buying a condo, the condo gets approved separate than the, the financing. So obviously your loan gets approved with us. You can do you know, conventional loan, FHA loan, VA loan, um, even USDA. You know, we see a lot of USDA condos, but um, the, the condo gets approved outside of your financing. So we have a whole condo department that, that approves condos. And you know, a lot of times if we've already approved that, that condo in the last year for financing, then we, we use that approval. And just update some of the information on the questionnaire for the, the condo association. But most people think that you know if there's a lot of investors in there, so if, the, if it's over 50% investor concentration, that it's a non-warranted condo. Uh, the way to avoid that with most of the investors, so I have you know investors that buy these ones by NC State that are pretty much all rented out. Um, so the way to avoid that is putting a larger down payment. So if you're at you know 25% down payment on a second home and investor property, then we we do what's called a limited review. And they really don't do the full, you know, review of the questionnaire with investor concentration, all that good stuff. So it avoids a lot of the, 
the typical you know approval things that you would need for condos. And when you do the limit review, the investor concentration is not really a factor. Uh, so a lot of people come to me and say, "Hey, I have a non-warrantable condo. Can you do it?" It's not really not warrantable. It's just you know the the other, other the lender that they've been talking to is probably basing on the full review. Which on the full review, you can't have more than fifty percent of the the units to be in the second homes and investment property when you're buying an investment property. So that's that's really the biggest difference there um, that you guys need to know when it comes to condos is investor concentration is not really a, a big thing like it, like it, a lot of people have thought in the past. Um, and on a primary residence, if you're if you're doing the full review for primary residence, say you're putting down 3% down or 5% down, that investor concentration can be anything. You can, as long as you're living there as a primary, and they, they can be 80% of the units rented out, it doesn't really make a difference to you. Uh, but there's different rules and I don't want to go too too far into what's the full review and what's the limited review, but that's the main difference there is on the limited review when you're putting down 10% down for a primary residence or 25% down for a second home and investment property, then the occupancy rate is not the issue there. Uh, investment purchases, I'll, I'll put this in here because I, I work with a lot of investors. Uh, I'll probably have usually on a monthly basis around three to five investors every month buying properties. Um, I have some investors that are on their one of my guys on his 13th property. So you know we can we can go above 10 finance properties um, that most most lenders can't do. We have some options for that and it really it ends up being a simpler loan than his other 10 properties that he bought there. So with investment properties the minimum is 15% down. Uh, they get the best rates at 25% down though. And right now so the Fannie Mae I put a I put a um, notice to lenders that they won't lessen you know, nationwide when it comes to all mortgages that are primaries, you know, second homes, investor properties. They wanted less than seven percent of the nationwide mortgages to be second home and investment properties. So you see a lot of lenders increasing their rates right now because of that hit to try to you know avoid some of the the costs that are that the Fannie Mae is going to you know, levy to them the fees when they go above that threshold. One of the main things that does for us is we put it on that hit mainly on the on the refinance side. So we we have higher refinance rates on second homes and investment properties, but our purchase rates are, are really good. Um, and you know, like I said I work with a lot of investors. So we we're pretty much the best rates in town when it comes to investors right now. With with putting down twenty five percent down, you know, we have a client that he's making an offer yesterday. It's like three point four three seven with no points on twenty five percent down payment. So really good rates. Um, so definitely, if you have any investors, have them talk to me. We can, we, we usually have the best rates around when it comes to those. Um, Let me ask you yeah. a question. How would you see the separation if I want to get an investment property? And I like a rent, mm -hmm. understand that, but I want to get an investment property. Would I be treated, uh, would I get this 15% down? Because it's not technically my primary home. Yeah. Because I'm renting. Yeah, you can. But you can, I want to buy investment property because maybe I just want to rent or just make money off that investment property. You can, yeah. yeah. And you would apply the same 18 percent, or would you treat it as just a primary home that I'm going to invest? In? So it's it's treated like an investment property because your your intent is not to live there. Right. Um. So you can you can be renting, you can be staying at home with your parents to buy an investment property. Okay. Um. So you don't have to have you know a mortgage expense or a rental expense or. You know, any housing expense really in combined investment property as long as you come up with a down payment. Um, there's different reserve requirements depending on how many properties you buy and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the things like let's say you're living at home with your parents, you want to buy an investment property and you want to use the market rent to offset the mortgage payment. If you don't have a housing expense now, so if you don't have a mortgage or a rental payment, then we can't use the market rent on that you know subject property that, that you're buying to offset the mortgage. So you basically have to qualify with that, more, that new mortgage. You know, plus all your other debts, which obviously if you don't have a housing expense, hopefully you can you can afford that. But um, but if you are if you have a mortgage now on a, on a primary residence or you are renting somewhere, you know, whenever the appraiser goes out there, we can tell them to do the market rent analysis, and they say hey, it's going to this property averages they're going to pull comps just like they do on the on the sale side. They're going to pull comps for rentals too, so they they'll pull three or four rental comps and see what their rental um, rentals going for in the area. And we can, use, we can use the average of that rent to offset your mortgage payment too. Uh, so that, that helps out with investors as well. And then of course, that first year that you have that property and you get it, you know, let's say you buy it this month and you rent it out next month, that first year we can we can use that lease 
on that property to offset their mortgage payment. So if you're going to go buy another property in two months, you know, you're really going to have very little hit for that property you just bought because we're using that lease to offset what you, what you just bought. And you can you know, keep keep doing that without really hitting your debt to income ratio as well. Oh, okay. Cool. How long do you have to maintain your mortgage to be considered income, rent income, if you want to go for a second property? So you can you can do it the first month. Like let's say you rented out you rented that property out tomorrow. We can use that lease you know, you know, tomorrow to offset that, that next property that you that, that property that you just bought. Um, so that's that's one of the newer rules that they, they put into place in the last few years is using that lease sort of up front. Um, there's there's certain rules when like if you're buying an FHA home and things like that with, with using a, a home that you converted from a rental property that those get into a little bit trickier situation. But on the investment purchases, you know if you're if you bought a home this month, we can use that lease right away to offset that. Um, when it comes to like going into next year, then we use the tax returns to, to see what your rental income analysis is. We use that to offset it. Um, so when you, when you go into further years, we use the tax returns. But that first, the first year that you buy it, we're looking at that lease to offset it. And you still, you still seventy five out of the income, the monthly income person. Seventy five. Yeah. So we use so if we seventy five out of the amount that you're receiving from the rent. Yeah, yeah. So we use seventy five percent of that lease okay. uh, to offset it. So let's say that it's always seventy five the max. Yeah, because oh. there's a twenty five percent vacancy so factor. Or, yeah, yeah. Because it, you know, we treat it as it's not going to be one hundred percent rented. So they they take a twenty five percent vacancy factor. So if it's eighteen hundred dollars a month, they use seventy five percent of the eighteen hundred dollars to offset the mortgage. Uh, so it's not quite all that that lease there. So that's why a lot of times it can cover all of it. Sometimes it doesn't, depending on how much you lease it for. Um, another thing, out-of-state buyers, you know, a lot of our things are electronic. Um, out-of-state buyers, they end up doing, have my guys in Florida that buy properties, they have mobile dirties to go out and check your house and sign the, sign the uh, closing documents and they, they get them FedEx back up here and really easy process for out-of-state buyers. And that's, that's one of the big things that we're seeing, especially now that these big you know, corporations are coming on app and everything, we've seen a lot more out-of-state buyers and uh, it's really an easy process for them. You just have to take, one thing to note as a real estate agent is the closing time on that. So let's say they're trying to close on the 30th of this month. Really, the attorney needs the package out by the 28th to send to the buyer to sign on the 29th, and then they send it back on the 30th to record. Uh, so that's that's one of the biggest things when it comes to you know, out-of-state clients that are buying properties like this is the lead time going up until when you're actually recording. Um, so if you're if you're planning on you know closing on the 30th, making sure you have that lead time to to Give them time to get get the package back to the attorney to record it um, because if they if they sign on the 30th and they're going to mail that package back overnight they can't record that until the 31st or the first if anyone when, when the next day falls um, so that that can impact the sellers and things like that that's, that's one of the biggest things to take note of when when you have an out-of-state client that's buying your property because they're not they're obviously not here local to go sign the attorney's office uh, this is in property inspection waivers we you get a lot of questions about these uh, because on, even on purchases you can get an appraisal waiver. Uh, so I, you know, I have clients that they put down, let's see, a, it, it, on a list price of four seventy five, they went up to like five twenty five. They went fifty thousand dollars over. Um, they were putting twenty percent down. I ran it through the system. We got an appraisal waiver, so they avoided that appraisal. So we didn't have to worry about any appraisal shortfalls. So you know, with with, with that appraisal waiver, the the system accepted that value of 525, so then we don't have to send the appraisal out there to see what you know what the comps are and things like that. So it really is beneficial for for purchases and, and a lot of refiles too. So you will see on purchases that we you know we can do those appraisal waivers. So that's that's something that you know if they're putting you know 20 percent down or more on, on the on the purchase transaction, we can we can sometimes do an appraisal waiver if the if the system you know accepts the value that we put in there when we run it through our automated system. So the next section is on government loans, FHA, VA, USDA. I did a sort of a, a basic breakdown of these. Um, FHA obviously has a minimum of three and a half percent down payments, and you know you do have those you know NC housing down payment assistance programs that can add you know they can take care of a lot of that down payment, which we'll go over later. Um, minimum of 580 credit score. A lot of times, if you're putting down um, you know three and a half percent down, it's going to be hard to get a 580 credit score approved. You know for 
for three and a half percent down. Usually, usually need a little bit larger down too. But we can go down to a five eighty credit score though. Um, I would say these are you know, similar property types as before: single family, two to four unit condos. Condos do have to be FHA approved. Uh, that's when you're doing condos with FHA loans. That's the tricky part is whether or not they're they're FHA approved. Um, because if we if it's not FHA approved now, to get it FHA approved, it, it takes you know probably 30, 45 days for HUD down in down in Atlanta to review that if we send it off to them to review it to, to get it approved, which obviously is not going to not going to be good for your purchase. So, um, usually, if we're if we're making an offer on an FHA condo, we're going to make sure it's approved first. If we, otherwise, if we're waiting, then the, the seller's going to go to someone else on that. But they, we, they can do FHA and for the, for the condos there. Manufactured homes, we, we can do those with FHA as well. Uh, the biggest thing with manufactured homes is you always have to have a structural inspection with FHA. Conventionally, you only need structural inspection if you have additions to the property or if the appraiser notes any potential structural issues. Uh, but definitely, if you have any anybody buying manufactured homes in FHA, then you always have to have that structural inspection. So it's good to go ahead and get that taken care of up front when you order your inspections there. Um, FHA has upfront mortgage insurance of 1.75 that gets added to the top of the loan. And they have monthly mortgage insurance, and that, that depends. The monthly mortgage insurance depends on the down payment. If you're doing three and a half percent down payment, it's 0.85 percent. If they're doing more, if they're putting down five percent or more, it's 0.8 percent. Uh, so it does give a little bit of a little bit lower mortgage insurance when you're putting down more than three and a half percent down, so putting five percent out or more. Uh, they do allow for more seller contributions, which is not really a big factor in this market um, than conventional does with with the lower down payments. Uh, the, the other things you as you run into somewhat often is not having federal debts. Let's say they, they default on the student loan, um, then FHA is going to have what's called a CAVERS system that we run, and it'll tell us that there's a federal default on there. And so they, until they get that federal default either you know, reinstated or, or taken care of, then they can't do an FHA loan. So that's one of the things that you, that you run into when we try to order what's called the FHA case number, which we ordered that when we do the appraisal. So we, we see it up front um, when, when they have that issue. Um, but it really only becomes an issue if it's something that we don't see on the credit report. So if it's something that's that's old, that's not on the credit report, that's that's one that that can really hurt you there um, with with the cavers running and having the federal debts in, in collection. Uh, the other thing they, they do allow higher debt to income ratios. Uh, so the front end versus back end. The front end is your is your mortgage payment compared to your income. The back end is your total debts so or your, your mortgage payment plus all your your car loans, student loans, everything. Uh, compared to your income, so they go, they can go up to 56.99% on on the back end, which is pretty high. That's that's your pre-tax earnings. Obviously, someone that's that's doing 56.99% of their pre-tax earnings before they take out taxes is is probably you know setting themselves up for a lot of a lot of um, stress when it comes to paying their bills every month. But we can go pretty high on the debt income ratios. Um, hopefully, it's someone that's not using their spouse and things like that on the loan because they have other income in the house. But, uh, we can do manual underwrite. So, like I was saying before, the when you get, get the appraisal waivers, that's done by the automated system. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about automated systems. So we we get the full application from you. It it has all your income, your assets, your debts, your credit report, everything on there. We take that and run it through the automated system, and it gives us an approval um, for any any loan that we're doing, conventional FHA, VA. Um, but on these type on FHA loans and VA loans and USDA, we can do manual underwrites on these. So if the system doesn't give us an approval as long as you fall in like the the debt to income ratios for manual underwrites which are lower so we can't go this high on, on manual underwrites you usually go to 31 31 front end and 43 back end on these so if, if you if you have you know pretty strong debt to income ratios and not really bad credit in the last year we can do a manual underwrite too um, that's that's another good thing with fha is they have a little bit of flexibility as far as the approval um, if we don't have the automated approval there and then, of course, uh, more stringent on, on requirements for appraisers. So, that any safety issue, uh, the FHA appraiser is going to know. So, if there's like peeling paint or you know holes in the wall, anything like that, you know the, the decks in disrepair, the appraiser is going to know that, uh, which is why you see a lot of a lot of people when you're when you're making multiple offers there uh, want to go for the conventional offer compared to the FHA or, or VA offer. Um, so that's that's one thing you see a lot in this this market. Any? Yes. So with the manual underwrite, are you saying that you can override the decline of the automated? You can, yeah. So as, as long as you fit into, you know, the 
the debt to income ratios and you don't have bad credit for last year and you have you know, some, some good compensating factors let's say you have some savings saved up or, or there's different compensating factors that they look at uh, we can we can do a manual on the right if, if the system doesn't get the approval and that's is really good that, that comes into play a lot when you have people in bankruptcy because you can buy a home in chapter 13 bankruptcy as long as you count that chapter 13 payment against you and your other debts and, and you, you meet the requirements there the system's never going to get some approval on someone that's in bankruptcy um, or even you know, two years outside of bankruptcy we usually give you the approval uh, so the manual underwrite right is really key for those type of people that are you know in bankruptcy or just coming off bankruptcy because it's not really going to give us the all right approval and any restriction for the rent of the So it's up to the automated underwrite system. If it gets an approval, we can go with it. Um, if it doesn't, then, then we, with a manual underwrite, we have to have a little bit longer length history. It can't be like a one year history. So as long as we get the other yeah, so as long as we usually two years, but as long as we have the automated approval though, we can we can go with a, a one or two month history. And we, we base our decision based on what the automated system tells us as far as that length of history is. So it, it can vary based on the client and how strong they are. Uh, VA. So VA is obviously no down payment required for VA. Uh, so you can be active duty or, or eligible veterans. Um, we, we pull what's called a certificate eligibility for them. Um, there's certain requirements when it comes to how long you've been active duty as far as whether or not you're eligible yet, um, as well as you have to be in service for a certain amount of time for veterans. But usually they know when they're discharged if they're eligible for getting a home loan. Uh, so they'll, they'll get that certificate eligibility when they're Usually when they're discharged or where they can pull it themselves or we can pull it. Um, no down payment required, but they can put a uh, down payment on on the loan. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people, if they want to reduce their funding fee, if they have the money to put down, um, if you put down 5% or 10% down, it will reduce that funding fee up front. Um, the funding fee is a, similar to FHA. It gets added to the top of the loan. Uh, so it could be 2.3% or it could be put down to 1.65, depending on you know, what you're putting down. Or even lower. Um, so that the funding fees and based on the down payment, but again, it's, it's not something that's, that's paid out of pocket by the veteran. Uh, so there's very little cost when it comes to a VA loan because we don't have we don't have any lender fees when it comes to VA loans. Uh, so the main thing they're paying is like the attorney fees, the appraisal fees, and then your escrows. But it usually ends up being you know on a two three hundred thousand dollar house, it usually ends up being you know four to five to six thousand dollars that they're needing as opposed to something that could take more for a regular conventional FHA client. So definitely lower cost with VA. Um, they go down to a 580 credit score as well. Um, again, the, the funding fee can be exempt if they have a service-related disability, but they wouldn't know that. Um, they're, usually, they're usually getting you know, some type of disability fee from the, the VA with these, um, or you know, they, they already know that they have that service-connected service disability. Uh, there's no, the, the key thing about VA, there's no matching debt to income ratio. I've, I've had loans get approved at 65 or 70 percent debt to income ratio um, because they look at what's called residual income, which is a different calculation. They they take your your income minus the taxes that you pay out and Social Security that you pay out on your on your uh, paycheck, and they deduct your monthly debts from it. And if it meets a certain threshold based on your household size, then that's an approvable uh, measure for them as opposed to the, the debt to income ratio. So different different calculations when it comes to um residual income versus debt to income ratio yes so with the funding fee um you said there's no out of pocket it's not out of pocket for them it gets added to the top of the loan they can pay it out of pocket if they want to uh, if they wanted to bring the money to the closing they can um, but use it it gets rolled into the top of the loan so let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars and it's a two thousand dollar um fee then their loan amounts a hundred and two thousand dollars instead of a hundred thousand dollars right okay and so you say they also can be exempt from that if they have a disability. Yes. Okay. It's usually like 10% or more disabled um, with a service connected disability. It makes them exempt, but they'll, they usually know that coming into it, whether or not they are. But whenever we pull the stipulated eligibility, it'll tell us on there if they're exempt or not and if they've used it before. So if, they, if they've used the VA eligibility before to buy a house, they're going to have a higher funding fee than someone's using it for the first time. Um, so those, those are going to vary as well. Yes. You know projects that one will use for a new construction, 
uh, be it private that um, like if they're just you know going in and buying a lot and having that developer. So those are rare. Um, I had this question yesterday. Um, and those those are rare. They they do have VA construction firm loans, but they're rare as far as who has them. Um, we used to have a construction firm loan, but it was only conventional before COVID. Um, COVID sort of wiped that product out for us. But there are certain banks um, that do VA construction firm loans. They're they're pretty rare as far as who does them. But that is that is an option. But it's it's hard to hard to find one that does that. Um, again, they they're going to have more stringent. Um, property requirements when it comes to the appraisals you know any you know handrail they're they're more concerned about safety when it comes to you see a lot of issues with handrails um you know if they had termite damage or carpenter bees or something handrails you will see that on, on the appraisal um, list there but they're a little bit different requirements when it comes to fha versus va appraisals they do have a little more strict requirements when it comes to safety for the veteran um because then again they, they want to make sure that the veteran is you know, living in a good environment you know that's a very a lot of safety measures in that form. Um, one thing that's always required for VA loans is termite inspection. So that's that's something that when you're ordering your inspections up front, always do the termite inspection. If it's on a private private water, um, you have to get a water test as well. And then you know if if the appraiser notes any any glaring deficiencies in the um, septic system, is the only time we need that. We don't always need a septic inspection. Uh, but if if the appraiser says that. You know, it looks like the septic inspection inspe inspe system um, is in disrepair, then we may need a septic inspection. But usually, you're just looking at a termite inspection, and then if, if it's on a private water, you need water check. USDA is the third government loan type that we're looking at, and that's no down payment required. There are obviously area income, area restrictions when it comes to that, um, and it has household income limits. So this is different than. You know, conventional FHA VA, there are household income limits based on you know, the household size and the area you're buying in. So if you're buying in Raleigh compared to let's say you're buying in Nash County and Rocky Mountain area, you can you can have more income um, in Raleigh than you do in, in that area. So the income limits vary depending on the area that you're buying in. And sometimes it can be the, the county cutoff line. So if you're buying um, like in the Durham area and it happens to be in Granville County, they have different income limits in Durham County. Uh, so it gets tricky when it comes to, you know, where you're exactly buying, especially new construction homes. When we don't, when we can't pull up on the map exactly where that is, and we sort of rely on you guys as far as where that is on the map and what area that's in, because you know, the Raleigh area versus Durham area, or you know, falling on, on certain counties outside can, can vary depending on those household income limits. Um, again, it's it's a 580 minimum credit score. Most most lenders don't go down to 580. We do. 580 is a manual underwrite. Um, usually below a 640 to 660, you won't. Usually below a 640, you won't get a um, automated approval. So we have to have a manual underwrite below 640. But as long as you have good credit in last year and in the past, you know, credit deficiencies that you had, um, we can explain those and that they're out of your control and you, you have taken measures to correct those. And we, we can a lot of times get the you know, down to a 580 credit score approved as long as everything else matches up with debt to income ratio requirements and things like that. Um, so their standard requirements are 29 or 41 when you're doing those manual underwrites. If you have an automated approval, you can go up to higher debt to income ratios. And I've even seen up to 47% of get approved for, for the automated approval. So the, it, it all depends on what the system tells us for those higher debt to income ratios. But if you don't have the automated approval, we have to go up to the lower debt to income ratios, which you know, it's usually if you if you're talking about someone that doesn't have a lot of income based on household income limits, it you know depending on the price range, it can be hard to fit into the, the standard debt to income ratio there, depending on what other debt you have, whether it's car loans, student loans, things like that. Uh, there is an upfront guarantee fee, you know, similar to VA, it gets added to the top of the loan, and then the monthly fee is called an annual fee, and that's that's a smaller smaller fee, but it is a monthly. Um, fee of 0.35%. So it's a lot lower than FHA, a lot, a lot better loan when it comes to that. Um, and they do have that monthly mortgage insurance there. Um, again, manual underwrites are allowed. And then the water test is needed if it's, if it's on a you know, private water. Uh, we need that water test. Um, we don't need the septic inspection unless your appraiser knows anything when it comes to septic.
here's a breakdown of um, student loan types. This, this has been a big topic because FHA just changed their um, student loan requirements when it comes to you know what what they count against you. Now they're down to you know, the payment on the credit report or 0.5% of the balance. It was that we were counting, we used to have, have to count 1% of the balance. If you have a $100,000 in student loans, we had to count, we had to count $1,000 against you on a monthly basis. Now it's only $500 or if it's on the credit report, depending on the, you know, if it's a zero, um, zero balance compared, you know, or it can be a you know, $20, $20 a month on $100,000. We can count that $20 a month. So it, it varies. To, you know, there's some there's some exceptions in there in, in those as far as what we count, but uh, for the most part, these are the, the breakdowns there. So Fannie Mae counts a little bit higher um, balance if it's in forbearance or uh, if it's in forbearance or in not in repayments in the firm. Um, but if if it's on the credit report though, and let's say it's a twenty dollar uh, a month hit, then we, that's all we have to kind of get you Fannie Mae. Um, Freddie Mac and FHA are similar. VA has a different calculation. They they do five percent of the, the total balance divided by twelve. So it's, a, it's a little bit lower than what you would count for the other ones. Um, and USDA is the greater of what's on the what's on the credit report or documented payment or 0.5% of the balance. So that's a lot of things. A lot of times, um, someone with a with an income based repayment for USDA and they have a really low uh, payment on student loans, we still have to count a higher payment against them. That's, that's one of the biggest differences between the other loans is we have to count that higher payment for USDA than we do the other loans based on what's on the credit there. Jumbo loans, uh, this is one of the things we just rolled out um, the movement for jumbo program. It's actually a securitized program by movement. Um, typically jumbo loans are investor based. So they'll be backed by like Chase or Goldman Sachs or the big, you know, big money investors. So they have different, you know, overlays on, on their side when it comes to requirements for the jumbo loans. This one's actually securitized by us. So we make the rules on it. Um, so we have a little bit of flexibility when it comes to like debt to income ratio of 45%. And most, most jumbo loans are looking at a max 43%, sometimes 41% or lower, depending on the requirements there by the investor. Um, we can we can go down to a 660 credit score on this as well. Yeah, 660 credit score over here. Um, so that, that's the other other big thing is it can go down to those lower credit scores. The one of the things this does do, uh, which is not common to jumbo loans, is we go off the, the D or underwriting finding, which means the Fannie Mae system that we run conventional loans with, we run these loans through those systems. And if it gets the approvals, what we, we base our approval on. Uh, typically for a jumbo loan, it's like a manual underwriting because it's not, it doesn't fall into the, the Fannie Mae uh, underwriting spectrum. Now what that does is it, it makes us not be overlay heavy. Uh, so we go based off of Fannie Mae rules when it comes to things as opposed to normal jumbo rules. Uh, so they make some flexibility when it comes to some of the guidelines, which is, Makes it a little bit easier to qualify for these. Uh, there's no uh, additional pricing adjustment for self-employed buyers. Um, that's, that's one of the big things with jumbo products. They have a higher rate just because they're self-employed. Uh, this program doesn't have that. And the reserve requirements are lower. Typically for jumbo loans, it's usually 12 months minimum for most programs, sometimes there's six programs, some six months minimum. But this this can be as little as three months, depending on you know what what they're what they're doing with buying it. Uh, primary purchase and their credit score and things like that. Uh, but there's, there's a whole chart that we looked at as far as how much is required, but they, they do require less reserves. Um, so reserves are basically your mortgage payments times you know, three months or 12 months. So if, let's say you have a, a $5,000 mortgage payment, typically on a jumbo product, they wanna see an extra $60,000 on top of the cash you need for closing in reserves. Um, with this program, let's say it's $5,000 a month, we can need as low as like 15,000 for reserves on top of your cash flow. So, you know, people that don't have, you know, a lot of extra cash on top of what they're putting into it, this is a really good program for as well. But the main thing is the rates are phenomenal right now. On this, we just rolled out and you know, I locked in a million dollar loan yesterday with 10% down. No, they have no mortgage insurance, even a 10% down. And it was a 3.25 rate uh, with no points. So, so no, what would be an example? So if you're going above that 548 250 loan amount, uh, let's say you're buying a, a $800,000 home and you want to put 10% down, 
that's a jumbo loan because you're above that minimum, that maximum Fannie Mae loan limit. Um, the maximum? About 48, 248. So that, that's, that's when it comes to the jumbo spectrum. Um, so if you're putting down, if your loan amount is above that 548, 250, and you know, let's say you're buying a million dollar home, you're gonna put down 10%. We can do that with this program. And it's really, really comparable with rates when it comes to, to that and, and conventional loans. But um, typically jumbo rates are gonna be higher with 10% down, but this, um, you know, like I said I locked one yesterday with 3.25, no points, no mortgage insurance. They're, they're doing a million dollar loan, so it's really, really good program, really good rates. 20% down was like 2.875, um, so even, even better than conventional loans. So. Okay, some other requirements. So the, you know, there's the minimum FICO score, the, the credit score. Uh, we can go down to 660, 680 for cash out, 680 for second home purchase. Um, and cash out refund in the second home 700. The maximum amount, we can go up to $3 million for this program. So if you're, if you're buying a $3 million home, we can do it with this program. Um, and of course, you have lower limits based on buying second home. Can you explain what the difference is in the FICA score versus you going behind and going to the credit card yeah. and all this other stuff? What's the difference in what, what do lenders want to see? Yeah, so we when we pull us a completely different scoring model than they use. So mm -hmm. Credit Karma, for example, uses a 30-day scoring model, mm -hmm. which no lenders use. When it, when everything is a five score, it's like a seven year snapshot of your credit. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be different there. If you have really good credit in the last 30 days, you're gonna have a high credit karma score. But if you in the last seven years you have really great credits, um, then you're gonna have a lower score when we pull it. So that's the biggest difference um, is a scoring model. And every you know, like a mortgage company uses a different scoring model than a credit card company or a car dealership. Uh, they all have different scoring models. Um, so, you know, when, when we pull it, we, we pour, pull a mortgage credit report and it sort of takes into consideration that you're getting a mortgage as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's usually, it, it can be similar to Credit Karma if you have really good credit, but if you have you know, okay credit, it's usually going to vary depending on wh what your credit's been in the last 30 days versus it's been in the last seven years. Um, The lower, the, the lower, lower two. Yeah. yeah. So it's always the lower of the other okay, two. The two of them. Yeah, but if you do three scores, it's the middle the one. Middle. Um, if you have one score, we should that score. Um, we can, we can even, you know, if if you're buying a house with your your spouse or something, you have no score and they have a 780 credit score, we can even do that scenario too. Do, the do you guys have like um alternative kind of credit? Yeah. Do you guys do? Yeah. So alternative credit, mm -hmm. you basically can show other trade lines. Um, yeah, if, if you have no score and the system requires you to show alternative trade lines, we have to show like, a, like electricity, you know, electricity, rent history, insurance payment, you know, cell phone payment, things like that. It shows if you have good repayment history outside of what's on your non non existent credit, really. Um, so, is it better to have uh, a, a score than to have no score? Have no credit? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, unless you're buying with someone, like you're buying with a spouse and they have really good credit, mm -hmm. um, and the system gets the approval, then a lot of times we can avoid the alternative credit for, for the person without it. And really we can base off the credit score of the, the person that has the credit for when it comes to rate and everything. So that, that helps as well. It used to be that if you had no credit, we we treat it like you have a 620 credit score. So the rates would be a lot higher. Um, so it, it definitely helps out with that as well. So in what in what situation would you just have two credit scores instead of three? So usually credit union members are going to be the biggest ones. Uh, so state employees used to only run through Equifax. Um, mm -hmm. I used to work at credit union back in the day when I was first out of college, but um, they, they used to only do Equifax. Now they do Equifax and Experian. 
Um, so they usually, some of their loans, they report to two bureaus. So they usually, that's usually people who are going to have one or two scores that they, they've only done credit through the credit union. Um, or they, there are other creditors out there that only report to one or two bureaus. So if, you, if you've only done credit with those type of creditors, then you're only going to have one or two scores there. Um, because if you, if you haven't had credit for, let's say, TransUnion for the last six months, it's been reporting, then that score goes, that score goes dormant and you don't have that score anymore. Um, so you, you can like you can have you can have history in the past seven years and you pay all your stuff off and we pull your credit you have no credit score now because you haven't had credit in the last six or twelve months um, so your scores went dormant and a lot of times for those people it's just a matter of like getting a new credit card or charging card that they cut up and then it'll you know boost their scores right away because they, they've had credit in the past which has been dormant. So, some credit cards only because they're requiring one agency and maybe yeah. they have to last them are you referring to the credit bureau or yeah. just one right yeah yeah it's always it's always good to, to know like how many who is reporting to when it comes to on a monthly basis there's some other specialty programs that we have uh, so we just wrote out these two programs uh that are in-house programs that that we that we have and one's a doctor program you know depending on their degree and their their job title we can go up to 100 percent financing form um some of them or, or 97 percent so there's a max depending on the, the degree that they have and their, their job side on things um, i think the um the chiropractors are like 97 percent there's, there's a whole list of different doctor types that you can have there um they are adjust rate mortgages so it, it is something that they would eventually want to refi out of but you know competing with different banks that have different different doctor programs this is very competitive when it comes to to those they go up to eight hundred fifty thousand um, dollar loan amount and a minimum seven hundred credit score. Uh, the can do condo program, something we just wrote out to you for non warrantable condos. Um, again, you know, non warrantable doesn't mean what a lot of people think it does, but if it is truly non warrantable, let's say because of commercial space or um, you know, diff different factors, let's say that a lot of a lot of things that we're running into with non warrantable condos these days are. If the condo has like a, a concierge desk and they rent out the spaces for you um, and, and it sort of looks like a hotel you know it's a condo um, a lot of times you see that at the beach then those condos are technically not paying with credit approved so they're not warrantable now so you know a lot, a lot of those beach condos are coming into issues where we can't finance those but this program will actually finance those and they can have you know concierge desk you know therefore you it just looks like a hotel and um we can we can do those now this is that's one of the features and you know commercial space you know there's different different factors when it comes to that as well but that's that's the program that we just wrote out this in-house that we can we can do those without having to broker them out but we do have broker options as well down payment assistance programs um so we we do those to North Carolina housing like most other lenders and there's different types of down payment assistance programs i didn't go too in depth with these but there's a NC Home Advantage versus an NC First Home Advantage, and then there's a NC Home Advantage Tax Credit, which is most people know as the MCT. Um, they call it NC Home Advantage Tax Credit now. But the NC Home Advantage is different because the NC First Home Advantage versus NC Home Advantage, you're looking at income limits for those, and NC First Home Advantage is household income based. So you know, anyone in the household, we're going to count towards that income limit. If you have the NC Home Advantage, we can count whatever is on the application. So if we're only counting your base income, you make seven thousand dollars a month, and as long as, you know, you're going to be under that ninety-nine thousand dollar annual income limit, which they have now, it used to be like seventy-five thousand. Um, they they increase that every year now. But if we just use your base income, and you're below that annual income limit, and we don't need to count your bonuses or commissions or anything on that. Um, this program will fit for you, and they can give you you know down payment assistance um, depending on. You know, you can do FHA, VA, conventional, um, even USDA, and it's it's really a second mortgage with, with what it is. And after you know, year fifteen is fully forgiven, and years eleven through fifteen is twenty percent forgiven for year. But if you sell that home in the first you know, ten years, you have to pay that second mortgage back. So if they give you you know seven thousand dollars to go towards your down payment of your home, and you sell that home in the first ten years, then you got to pay that seven thousand dollars back when you sell that home. But it, it sits on there as a silent second mortgage. You're not paying any payments on or anything. There's no interest on them. Um, Which you, program is that? Just the NC Home Advantage. Um, so that's, that's the regular. That's like the normal down payment assistance program. And they can give you 
if you're doing conventional, it's three percent of your loan amount. So if you're putting down, you're sitting doing a, a ninety-seven percent conventional loan, it's three percent down payment. They give you three percent of the loan amount, so it ends up being like, you know, point one or point two percent that you need there to cover the rest of the down payment. And then of course your closing costs. In previous markets, you can see a lot of a lot of times the seller paid closing costs. You see very little money at closing, if any money at closing. Obviously in this market, you're not really going to sell it to pay closing costs. So, um, you're, just, you're really just paying your, your closing costs and the, the small portion of the down payment that you, you don't cover. Um, FHA, there's a 3% option and a 5% option. So FHA can cover a lot of that 3.5% down payment. Uh, so you need usually around 0.75% you know, of the down payment um, with 3% down option. 5% would cover essentially your down payment plus a little bit of closing costs, but it's a higher rate too. So <clears throat> as you as you go through the different programs, there's different rates based on the different program that you use. The five percent down payment option is higher rate than the three you percent know, down payment option, um, but it, it's still really good programs. And the the other one, the NC Home Advantage, the eight thousand dollar one. This is this is a standard eight thousand dollars. The other ones are based on your loan amount. So if you have a two hundred thousand dollar loan amount. And you're doing a three percent down payment assistance option, you get six thousand dollars. If you did a two hundred thousand dollar loan with this, you still get eight thousand um, dollars. But the biggest difference is the income limits and what we what we count. So you have to be a first time home buyer for NC First Home Advantage and I think NC Home Advantage Credit, which is NCC. Um, so you can't own a home in the last three years, and then you do have the household income up for that as well. Um, so they they have different rules when it comes to you know, if if you're buying the house. And you make seven thousand dollars a month as a base, but you have bonuses and commissions on top of that. Then those go into the income limits, and you can be over the income limits based on that. Or if you have, you know, your 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 twenty year old college student living at home, and we're going to count their income towards it. Or you, let's say your your spouse is working, but they're not on a loan, we have to count their income towards it, just like USDA. Uh, so there's there's different income limits based on you know what you're what you're looking at there. But then there's still I say really good programs. They do take a little bit longer to close. They go through a separate department um, than our regular loans. So you usually ask for at least you know, 30 days or so to close these um, because we underwrite it and then it goes to NC home, you know, NC housing for them to underwrite it after we do. Uh, so we have to get their approval after we get loan clear on our side. Um, but USDA does the same thing. That's another thing. The USDA has to go to USDA as well once we get it cleared as well. But so that these programs, down payment assistance and USDA, you take a little, little bit longer to close, but um, they're, they're really, saying really good programs. In the past, with the seller paying closing costs, you could you could do you know, very little money when it comes to buying a home. Um, but now with with the competition out there, it's hard to get those unless you're buying really remote areas for the, for the seller paying the closing costs. <laughs> Uh, renovation loans is another thing that we have. We have a complete renovation department um, that, that handles these as well. Um, so it's a little bit different than your normal closing process. When it comes to you guys, though, like your contract can be the same. So if they're buying a house for three hundred thousand dollars, you write the contract up just like a three hundred thousand dollar house. Um, when it, on the back end side, on the loan side, you know we're going to roll in repairs to that. So if they're doing thirty thousand dollars repairs, the loan amount is going to be based on a you know. A, a complex formula that we use to determine that. So the loan amount used is going to be higher than the purchase price. You'll see in the end, depending on the down payment. Um, so that, is, but the, the contract side is completely the same for you guys. Um, some of the things that can benefit with you guys, obviously the, the as is properties, uh, HUD properties, short sales, things like that. Um, or just the, the seller doesn't want to do any repairs and they need a new roof, they need a new deck. Um, I ran into that recently, there was an off-market property um, that buyers bought, and you know there was there was holes in the floor. The, the deck was the deck. The uh, appraiser wouldn't even walk on the deck because it was about to fall fall down. They needed a new roof, so we you know switching. We were doing a conventional loan. We switched to a uh, renovation loan and rolled everything into it. Um, but there is more work because the one thing we do is we got the event the, the contract that you use or contractors. You can use multiple contractors, um, but it's usually best to use a general contractor for these. Um, but there's, like I said, if you guys want a, a complete breakdown of how this works, we can go, go into them further later. But um, the other thing is investors. So obviously, when investors buy the homes, they like to upgrade everything to get the highest rent. Uh, so instead of you know putting all their money into that after closing and doing their liquid 
liquid funds after closing to, to, to go, go through and put all the um, upgrades into the property. They can do a renovation loans on them. There is a little bit higher rate for renovation loans, but it's not much higher. It's about a quarter percent higher, sometimes three percent higher. Not much difference in the rates uh, compared to the regular commercial loan. Is uh, life of this particular loan has like uh, two to three years, or what happened when the project is done? So, is a regular commercial loan or FHA That's loan or like a construction versus permanent loan, something like that? Not really. It's just a regular loan for us. But the, on the backside, so all the work is done after you close. You know, the closing process for you guys is similar. Then the, the only thing you're doing is getting the, the contractor to go out there and, and do the, the bids for us and everything. We have to do a lot of contractor paperwork on our side, um, but the, the process for you guys is similar. It's gonna close without any work being done on it, it's just like normal. So do a 30, 45 day closing on it. And then after the closes, then the contractor works with us to do draws on it. And, you know, the work is done after closing. So you guys will pay the contractor yep. for the work that you feel you So here's some different renovation products that we have. Uh, so FHA has two different types of products. One's a standard, one's limited, depending on how much work needs to be done. Limited is a streamlined renovation product for under $35,000 in uh, renovations. If you have more or more than $35,000, or if it's anything structural, anything like that, then it's a little bit more involved because you have to have a, a HUD consultant go out there and make sure that it's feasible and things like that. But um, <clears throat> there's the conventional side is called the home style um, and home style for investors as well. Uh, again, you can go into these with the minimum down payment, you have three and a half percent down payment. Uh, the minimum down payment for conventional, you know, you can, you can pitch into a 15 percent now for investors. Most of them are going to put more money than that down. Um, but there's, there's different rules depending on you know, what you're looking at doing. So, again, the, the steps of the renovation loan. Um, Obviously, it's going to be very similar for you guys. It's, it's executed with your actual sales price, um, just just like normal and everything. The renovation part comes into after the fact. The appraisal that we do, the biggest difference is the appraisal has to be done after we get the, the contract to bid. So if the contractor goes out there and does a bid for us, and they take three weeks to do the bid, then that holds up the appraisal being done because the appraisal is going to be subject to that work being done. Um, so if they if they're replacing a roof or replacing a deck. And, Doing all this work, the appraiser does it subject to that work being done. So it's sort of an after improved value. Uh, that's one of the biggest differences with the appraisal. But the rest of it is, is very similar for you guys. Is this truck takes any longer than the regular standard? Yeah, because we're working with a contractor and getting a, their bid in place and we're, we're getting their insurance requirements and things and making sure they're not going to go out of business next month and things like that. So there's just more, more paperwork involved with it. Um, but yeah, it takes a little bit, a little bit longer than a regular commission loan. Um, broker options, I touched on a little bit earlier. Uh, so we have multiple broker options, uh, whether it's an investor that can't quite qualify for a regular conventional loan, but they have money for a down payment. We, can, we have investor cash flow loans, uh, which basically that, that market we talked about earlier that the appraiser is gonna go through on the property. We can use that, we can use that solely to qualify the individual instead of their debt to income ratio um, the investor cash flow loan can take that market rent as long as it's over the mortgage payments, then we they can use that to qualify and it's a very easy process. Um, that can they can finance over 10 properties with that. They can even put the home in an LLC, they can put the, the title in the LLC. The loan has to be in their name, but um, it can be titled in an LLC. So that's that's one of the, the bigger differences there with that. And of course, we have bank statement programs and foreign nationals. Um, non multiple condos, asset utilization loans. There, there are some conventional options that do that as well, but um, interest only loans and commercial and land options. But I don't usually do the commercial land options. I usually just refer those to the local bank because it's a much easier process for you guys to go through somewhere local than having to do a broker option for those. Here's just some information about us uh, so when it comes to these different types of programs. So we have dedicated departments for different things that we talked about. For the condos, we have a whole condo department. Jumbos has their own department. Uh, renovation has a completely different department. USDA, down payment systems, and even VA is, is completely different than, than normal when it comes to our, our processing side. Our VA, we actually have a lot of VA 
a lot of veteran underwriters and, and processors that are on our, our VA team. So they are not only you know, processing underwriting for us, but they're actually veterans themselves. So we, we have a better, better connection when it comes to the VA loans than, than most lenders. Um, we, we started servicing loans last year. So that's one thing that you'll see for your regular loan types your conventional FHA, VA. Um, the biggest difference in the last couple of months is the second home and investment properties were only serviced around 50% of those just because of the Fannie Mae requirements now. But for the most part, when, the, when your clients close with us, they're going to get their mortgage statement every month and they'll have my picture on it just like these. They'll have my picture on there, my information on it. So they can call me with any, any questions they have every month throughout the, throughout the life of a loan there. So that's a good servicing thing that we, we do to, to have the customer service there um, you know, as good as possible for you guys. Yeah, we're just we're servicing them um, because we're we're a big enough uh, company now that we can we can start doing that and we took on the servicing side. It's, but still, the, the, the loans are still secondary. Well, but you guys do the servicing. Yeah, we're doing the servicing. So we're not really we're not really selling them. In the future, they may sell some of them depending on. What the portfolio and things look like, but for the most part, we're, we're holding these and servicing them. Um, so it's, it's similar to like your big banks and, and things that are doing it. You just give us a, a better customer service factor. Is that, is that why you guys have their renovation programs? No, we, no, we've been, we've been doing that for forever. Um, but it's just it's something that is more of a customer service thing than we, we started servicing because it's a lot of times when you know some you know. High net worth clients will, will only work with you for servicing a loan. So that's one of the things when they, when they come to apply with a mortgage, they're like, do you service a loan and you sell it off? And they, they could make a decision based on that. But it's just one more thing that we're, we added to the, the mix there. We're actually servicing them now. And it really just makes them a customer for life because um, they see our face every month and they can reach out for any questions. But that servicing transition, sometimes clients don't take it right. Like, you know, being a new company, yeah. new name, new phone number, and all that stuff. Yeah, and depending on their loan, it, it could be sold off like two or three times a year, and it makes it easier for them to have one one lender. Um, and you know, they, they can see my face every month. And, the same name. Yeah, and, and on our side, it helps out with future, you know, retention of the clients as well. So, um, obviously, we're committed to the best purchase process possible. So some of the some of the hits that we do, uh, let's say Fannie Mae gives us a, a mandate for certain things. We usually refer to the refinance side because we have the best purchase process for you guys. Uh, we can close as fast as seven, eight business days. Um, you know, I've closed one recently. It was they went under contract on Tuesday for the next Friday close days. Uh, so it ended up being like eight business days with July Fourth holiday in the middle of it. Um, so it's something that we can we can easily do. It wasn't really a rush or anything. It was, it was an easy easy process. They were just regular W two buyers. Uh, so we have a little bit different process than, than most lenders do. So we can we can close pretty quickly when it comes to um, getting you guys. Uh, and it really helps out with the offers as well. So you're, you're making an offer that's up against a cash buyer. Having a quick closing is going to help you out. Um, and we, we win a lot of deals not only because of the quick closings, but obviously name recognition. So we is the number one lender in the triangle. We have the number one market share as well as North and South Carolina. So you know most most lenders know who we are and that we're going to. You know, do things on time and things like that. Um, other things like the Movement Foundation. The Movement Foundation is our primary owner of our company. Um, so most mortgage companies are out there to make the most money as possible. And you'll see the their CEOs buy 15, 20 million dollar homes in the area. Um, our CEO is a former NFL football player and he he pays himself a modest living. Like he I think it's like 250, 300 thousand dollars a year he pays himself and he gives everything back to the, the foundation put into the community. So we just released yesterday our announcement of we just acquired a, a property for the fourth movement school. Uh, so movement schools actually are tuition free, you know, public and charter schools that are, that are funded completely by movement mortgage and our foundation. Um, so they're they're opening up the fourth school in 2022 and they're gonna move there. These are all in Charlotte. That's where our operations is based out of. Uh, but they're going to spread around the country as well. We'll probably have one in Raleigh here in the next few years. Uh, but just last year, I think we gave two hundred million dollars, and then just gave another, you know, five million dollars recently to from the foundation to the movement schools um, to help pay for these. So that's that's mainly where our profits go. It's back into the communities, whether it's through the foundation, the schools. They have a, you know, 
a monthly ten thousand dollars grant so they give out to different charitable donate charitable uh, companies around the the country that you know loan officers recommend that you know we reach out to you you know we will give a ten thousand dollar check to different charitable organizations around the country every month um, and then we have di different global outreach programs like um, farms in Uganda and things like that, that we, we give that we we fund and things like that to help out around the, the world as well this is our process that I, I was mentioning earlier. So we, like I said, we can close as fast as seven, eight business days. Um, there's restrictions when it comes to the timing of closing disclosures, things like that. So it's hard to close faster than like seven business days, but we can close you know, pretty fast because whenever we, the, the client goes under contract, we, we do the underwriting up front. So as long as they get this documentation up front, usually that first day is when we go to the underwriter and then we'll get it using the underwriter back within the first six hours that we're going into underwriting. Uh, so we have up front with the approval looks like, and then we work on the commission from there. And usually in the next you know, five days or so, we'll get those commissions cleared and pretty much have a complete loan ready to go, usually just waiting on the attorney to send this documentation or the appraisal to come back, depending on how, how long it takes the appraisal to get back. Um, they're usually about seven business days right now, but sometimes they can ask for longer. Um, they, like I said, we, we had the process here to, to help you guys have, have the, the easiest process as possible. Um, obviously, if anything comes up in underwriting, you know well within your due diligence period, um, which is in a huge factor now with as much due diligence money going out there as opposed to earnest money. But um, we, we, we certainly know up front if there's any issues with loan. But usually, if you have a good loan officer that's going to do a, a good job up front, you shouldn't have any issues when it comes to approval. Um, this, is, this is just a snapshot of how our, our process works here and how it runs through the system. That's pretty much it. Do you have any, any, any specific questions? I know we talked about a different, a lot of different loans brought up. So we had construction loans before COVID, um, but COVID wiped this wiped us out with that um, because because of all the layoffs and things. If, if let's say they started a construction loan today and then they got laid off from their job or you know different things that would happen to them, the since we our bank side would then have to like keep the loan forever as opposed to um, closing it as a, as a permanent loan. So there's different restrictions when it comes to that. So we, because of COVID and you know, different layoffs of millions of people, we had to um, put their product in a hold. And I usually just refer to that to a local bank again. So, will we get all this slides? Yeah. Okay. The hard part is it's a large attachment. I tried to attach the email while ago. It's like, 50 or 60 megabytes and that's the hard part is um i can i can certainly print all the slides out but well, i can i can probably print them to a pdf and send them to you oh, okay. i can just do that i'll just print them to a pdf okay. I will do my yeah i can um we we don't really because these are like a national level marketing they don't really do it just on north carolina because we're in all 50 states so they did it for every state a lot um but I, I have different things and um nt housing actually has some some different things on their website as well but up here i also put different um brochures for like construction like buying buying a newly constructed home um better uh, VA loan condos and, and different government loan, loan options uh, so if you guys want any of that as well as the interest of the party contribution so this tells you the breakdown of like what the seller can pay or what you can give if you're trying to get some commission to the clients, um, and then what, how much they can give for the interest part of contribution. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I do, I don't know if you got to see these up front, but we do these, so we, we do these playbooks every month as well. Um, and it's, these are really good for you guys as far as personal branding, but also different things to keep on track with your business and um, you know, best practices. It gives really good tips in here every month. Um, you guys can have plenty of these to give out as well. On a monthly basis, that, that'll help you out with your business. But if you have any you know, specific questions with, with different program types, just let me know. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, we certainly help out with that as well. You, you get more on the refinancing, you got you get a lot more property inspection waivers, so you can avoid appraisal a lot of, a lot of those. Um, I can stop by and talk to you. Yeah, naturally. Because I'm asking about our house. Yes. <laughs> we have four seven to five. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I just, um, I'm working on a refob. Somebody had a five and a half inch rate. Um, so they they went into a, they had a special program that we did a few years ago. It was a, called a Dream Down program. It basically gave you your down payment as a forgiven uh, as a second mortgage. It's basically 100 percent financing, 101 percent financing. Um, so they went into it with three percent down payment. It, it actually, in 101 percent um, loan to value. I just did the yeah. refi two years later. You got in the way with the course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think they're going to put this information out, but we have a event coming up on the 11th, the so two Wednesdays from now. Um, at North Hills Club, um, it's called Mindset of a Champion. I can have a couple of flyers. I don't have a lot of them, but I'll just give a couple of you know, look at them. Uh, so it's called Mindset of a Champion. It's one of our, he's actually a big regular speaker. Um, and he's going to be coming to Raleigh and speaking on like leading, leading on life with significance instead of just being successful. Uh, so it's really, really good program. And we're going to have obviously free breakfast. And, um, That's a long officer. No, he, he's a he's a coach. Um, he's actually like a motivation speaker and coach. Um, it's free. He's yeah, gonna free. be there. Yeah, he's gonna be doing. He's gonna be speaking. Are you um, gonna be there? I will. So it's gonna be. I think it's gonna be like 150 to 200 agents there. Um, so this this presentation is addressed to real estate. Yeah. Okay. Was that? Oh, they did. Yeah, I told her to put it on here yesterday. Yeah, so there should be a link on there. I gave you a link to sign up for you. Um, so if you guys want to sign up for that, that would be a good event. So the, yeah, be, I think it's like 150 turning agents and you can network and things like that as well. You guys have any other things you want to talk about? Yeah, so you can do you can do conventional and FHA now. Uh, you can only do conventional, but now they have enough FHA as well. system that gives the world your work. It's just a matter of what the system does. It's like a quality machine. 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 It's like a quality but it's just, it looks better to the system to have more equity into it. Just in case you need all things like that. I'll talk to them to see how it works. Yeah. The house just came on the market. Uh, they want the buyers to buy the solar panels for $35. Can you build that in now? So those are tricky. They're usually like second mortgages on already. Um, they're tricky. They do, they do have to like build into it. Um, I, I, I look at specifics on how much they're putting down, things like that. Um, but it, it, is, it, is, it is tricky to normal because it is a second mortgage on it. And as they get taken care of, and 
what usually happens is the you know, the, the seller pays it all um, with their proceeds or whatever. But yeah, it's it's better to do that um, as long as the house would appraise to you just have the seller paid off with their proceeds because it, it avoids the whole second mortgage and transferring over and things like that. Um, that's where it gets tricky. Yeah, I mean, it, those usually get taken care of by the seller, but if it's a special circumstance where it needs to be like passed over to the buyer, just I can look into it with you. See? I know you have paperwork. Yeah. yeah. This is just, I, mean, I have I, my whole office, I hadn't brought over yet, and I have a ton of paperwork on How do you compete with uh, the preferred lenders for the builders? Can you usually do what they're doing? Yeah, we can use it. They're usually charging higher rates into those lender credits. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. They're using, you know, charging higher rates into those lender credits. Um, unless it's like Lenar or something. Lenar will cut the rate just to save them all on that. And because they own the company. But if it's if it's a regular person that doesn't own a mortgage company, then a lot of times we can give a lender credit. It's just paying a higher rate, just like they would with other lenders. Because uh, most people think that they see three thousand dollars or four thousand dollars in closing costs, they think they're getting a good deal, but it may actually be better off not taking their closing costs, getting the lowest rate possible, and save money in the long run. But if they want the closing costs, we can all the times build build it into it just like they can. Um, so it's six twenty minimum. I thought it was six forty. Yeah, six twenty for conventional, um, and then five eighty for the government programs. It's hard to get a 620 approved with like without like a 40 or 50% down payment, but we can't go to the 620. You said you said they have a sizable down payment for that, or or just the reason why your 620 is because of medical collections or something like that. Um, if, it, if it's like four payments or something else, that can a lot of times not get approved. But if you just have a low credit score for medical payments, medical collections. And these maximums. So if you go above the maximum, then you're in a jumbo loan. Yeah, so here's a jumbo flyer. Uh, this program is phenomenal. Um, like I just did a jumbo loan, a lot of being our loan for a lady, putting 10% down. No more, there's no mortgage insurance on jumbo programs. And she was a 3.25 rate. Um, so it's really good. If you put 20% down, it'd actually be a better rate than uh, two point eight seven five. Usually, if you're like ten percent down, you, you're probably going to have a better credit 